Go to your Bibles, please. We're going to really be in the book of Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit and get 17 and 18 and part of 21, but the main focus today is 22, Genesis 22. I've called this for the next weeks that we'll be together on this mountaintop experiences, and this is a mountain of faith. You've got your place there in 22, but let me just backtrack for a moment and get you over there in 17, if you don't mind. I'm going to kind of hit the high points of this for my time's sake, but in chapter 17 and verse number 15, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to be called her Sarai, but will be called her Sarah. I will bless her and surely will give And will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her that she will be the mother of the nations of kings of peoples will come from him, from her that is. Abraham fell face down. He laughed to himself and said, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessings. But no, he says, but Sarah, he said to him, but your wife, will, Sarah, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac and I will establish my covenant. Now in this, Sarah also laughs. He's a hundred years old. She's 90. Word gets out, they're gonna have a baby. Now there's also a baby already born to him It's a mess up. He shouldn't have gone that direction. Ishmael is out there. We're still having problems with Ishmael today, by the way. That's the problems that's going on in the Middle East right now between the various fighting groups. Now, let me just give you over over there to chapter 18, please. Look with me, verse number nine in chapter 18. He says, where's your wife, Sarah, they ask. They're in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you at about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Verse 12 says, so Sarah laughed to her of salt and thought, am, after I am worn out and my master is old, how will I have this pleasure? Just everyday biology. Things don't work. And she, he's laughing. You're laughing. We're laughing about this thing. It can't happen this way. However, it does work. Look with me over then. We're going to get over here to chapter number um, 21. Let me get you to the 21 real quickly. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did that for Sarah, what he had promised. And Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. They keep on referring to the men being old. And at the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would be nursing children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, Hagar and Ishmael, they're sent away. There's an issue there. He shouldn't have gone that route. You can read a little bit further to get to this. Now we get to Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is a very difficult passage. It's difficult because of the essence of what happens here. Look with me. This is sometime later. Time has passed. Years have passed. Sometime later, it says, verse 1, chapter 22, God said, Abraham, he said, here I am. Then watch these words. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, to the region of Moriah. And here's the tough part. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. And early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Watch this phrase next. We 
will worship, then we will come back to you. He's been told to sacrifice his son. Yet there's a promise in this. We will worship, we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, just carrying a bundle of wood. And he carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went together. And Isaac spoke up and said, uh, <clears throat> Dad, yes, son, I got the fire and we got the wood, but where's the lamb? He's getting a little concerned at this point. Watch this. Verse number eight says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. That is a tremendous step of faith. God will provide the offering. He will provide the lamb. When they reached the place where God had told him about Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. I don't find a struggle. The boy apparently was obedient, not knowing what to expect. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his own son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. Same wording of calling here. He said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. And notice he's only calling his only son, even though there's another one by, by Hagar over here. Ishmael was a mistake. And Abraham looked up, verse 13, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of the son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on this mountain, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven the second time and said, I swear to my, by myself and declare the Lord that because you have done this, you have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and make you your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Through their, your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed there in Beersheba. Now, this is a tough person. Normally, I don't read the whole passage quite like this because there's so much involved with this. But here it is, verses 1 and 2. He said, I need you to take your son to Moriah and sacrifice him. Now, they prayed for they wanted, they wished. They got beyond years and said, okay, that's not going to happen for us. We just have to resolve ourselves. We're not going to have any children. And all of a sudden, God says, you're going to have a baby. And he goes, yeah, right. And then when Sarah hears about it, she really knows the difference. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not going to happen. And lo and behold, things happen. Biologically and apparently spiritually. God works miracles. God can still work miracles, by the way. But he tells now this son that who they've loved, who they've prayed for, who God brought as a miracle child, he said, now I want you to take him and sacrifice him. Now in this, the next morning, verse number three says, they get up and they go. I want you to see there's not an argument with God. Here's a step of faith. When God tells you, you know it, it may be directly in God's word. He doesn't speak in, in clouds today. He does, may not speak in another burning bush today, but he speaks clearly, clearly through the word of God. You don't pick and choose what you want. God said it. I believe it, and that's it. But it's better that I can go back and say, God said it, whether I believe it or not, that's still it, amen. So there was no argument. There's times that we, have to, we, we feed off our emotions. Well, I think God wants this, and I think God wants that. Be careful. Be careful. It may just be bad pizza, okay? Be careful. But when God gives you a directive, you obey. And I find that he didn't argue. Many of you, many of us, we argue with God. I argue with God about doing what I do today. God, I'm not adequate. And now that I've been doing this a long time, I'm still knowing that I'm not adequate. I feel like Moses, he said, I, I stutter and I stammer. And the Lord said, I want you to go ahead and do the job. Last night, we were on the Texas A&M campus down at College Station. That was my goal and my, my dream was to go to Texas A&M and be a veterinarian. As I drove around that campus, it was changing the last time that I'd been there, obviously, but 
what an ominous campus that was. Very beautiful, very well taken care of, and a lot of pride there. But God, in his wisdom, changed it. I argued the point. He won. Be careful. Sometimes be careful that you don't argue the point with God. Now, in this, you also find this. They're, they're going along. He gathers the, the wood. He gets everything prepared. He didn't go halfway out there. He, he got everything ready to go. The knife, the fire, the wood, and servants with him. And he tells the servants to stay behind. What I loved about that, the reason I emphasized it while I go, said, we will go worship, and we're going to come back. He could have said, we're going to go worship, and I'll see you guys later. Singular. But he's trusting God. He doesn't know about the ram in the thicket. He doesn't know anything out there on that hillside. All he knows is he's God's word. And sometimes it leads us into an area of darkness that we're not familiar with. And he lights the way as we take step by step by step. The ram is out there. He said, we will go. We will worship and we're going to come back. That's when they get to the mountain. And Isaac said, well, we got the fire and the wood, but where's the sacrifice? Maybe at this point here, he's getting a little nervous. Now, I don't know that God's asked for child sacrifice in any other place like this. This is testing his faith. This is a great chapter of faith. You've got great chapters in the Bible. You know, faith chapter over in Hebrews chapter 11. The great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. You can start naming off chapters. And this is that great faith chapter. It took a lot of faith. In a little bit, we're going to pass an offering plate. It don't take a lot of faith to put a dollar in the offering plate. It takes a lot of faith to put your last dollar in the offering plate. It don't take a lot of faith to do some things. You just kind of go along with the flow. But this is big stuff. And God would understand that for he sacrificed his son on the cross. Also on the hillside. Let me go back and show you this part of it. Verse number 10. When they reached, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. This wasn't make believe. This was real. This was real. I don't know if those of you that are dads, granddads, great granddads, dads to be. There's nothing more precious than your child. You've prayed for them on the way here. You've prayed for them when they're born. You've prayed for them when they go to school. You've prayed for them the first day of kindergarten. you prayed for them the first day of high school. You pray for them as they grow up. There's not a time you don't pray for them. You love those kids. Now, as a preacher, now my kid's not perfect. No, they took after you, so amen for that. There you go. The fact is, he took out the knife to slay his son. He had it in the air. He had it in his hand. And he's really about to do it. That's when the voice came from heaven. Abraham, sure glad he's listening. Sure glad there wasn't a thunderclap that didn't, he couldn't heard the voice, the sound of God. Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He responded to that to the call. He responded to that to what he was told to have a baby, and then the call to take, and take his life, and now to stop this process. He said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. I know now that you fear God. Now, couldn't God have already known that? It's a good question. I don't have an answer. Perhaps God was testing him. Perhaps God knew on the other side how it would come out. But Abraham wouldn't know that, and you may not know that either. God's going to take care of you as you step out in faith. You may not understand it. You may have to make some big decisions in life, and you don't understand it. More than just getting saved, that can't get any bigger than that, but more than just getting saved. But I'm talking about life issues, life day-to-day stuff. Can I do this? Should I do that? And God's going to direct us. God stops him. I put in my notes simply this. Abraham was really willing to do this. It blows my mind. I've had people through the years, when you do this for 40-something years, you, you know, and you stand in front of people, you, you, sometimes you get the negative hits. I don't like them. They don't feel good. But I can take them. But you mess with my kids, and the fight's on. And it should be the same way for you. I'm going to stand up for my children and now my grandchildren. 
And yet this precious child, he laid himself on that altar. And God stayed his hand. There as he looked on to the side, look at verse number 13. Abraham looked up and there saw a, in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns. And he went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it instead of his son. I could hear what the son said. The ram's horn is a symbol of deliverance. The shofar, the horn that would that's blowed, is a symbol of God's power and God's ref, in the reference to deliverance. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. The ram caught that ram had probably who knows how old it would have been, long enough to have horns, old enough to have horns out there that would have got caught as he's trying to eat, got caught in the brush. You could hear him probably bellowing and trying to get out of this thing. And Abraham says, "You're it, buddy. Your dinner. Here we go." And takes and cuts his throat and he drains the blood and he puts him on the altar. Then it says this. He went over and he took the ram. He sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, called that place. The Lord will provide. Now in this, the follow-up is this. He said, because you've done this, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your socks off. You're going to be the father of many nations, many people. More than the stars, more than the sand. They're going to be everywhere. And they are. Not only in their Israel area, the Holy Land, but all over, all over the world. Abraham's people. Abraham's people, does, they don't know Jesus yet. Some do. Some have met the Messiah personally. They know of Jesus. They know of a great prophet and a great teacher. They just don't know him as a savior yet. What a tremendous outreach to folks like that. They read through here. They can find it and correlate it to the New Testament. They, like, they want to stay with the old, obviously. But let me give you some things here that uh, refers to his willingness. Okay? One, we have to know his promises to be able to trust him. You've got to know him. You've got to know him. Trust him. Last night we did, we watched George Strait sing. Now you may not be a fan of his, but he sold millions and millions of records and he's done a lot of good things for people. But Teresa said, look at the band. And they were all sitting on stools because they're old. <laughs> the fiddle players stood up, the rest of them. And, but this is the band, Ace in the Hole, the band he's had for years and years and years. He doesn't have to go back and say, oh, key of B flat, uh, move, modulate. He, oh, no. Not only have they, have they rehearsed the show, they've played together now for the last 40 years. He started in 1981, same time I started. He's made a few more dollars than me. But they're a team. They work together. They know each other. And I'm sure riding all those buses together, there's probably been some differences of opinion through the years, obviously. But when it's time to go, they know how to do, the, do it right. When, you, when you're walking with the Lord and you know his promises, you know the word, it's easier to trust than the first time. So I, I don't know how to do this. We take a step of faith. Second thing is we, we have to receive his promises and I put in my notes simply this, listen and quit telling God how you're going to do it. Now you think, well, I'm a preacher. You got to look close to home. I know I did. Because I have to look at me before I can look at you. Quit telling God your timetable. Quit telling God how you're going to do things. You know, here's how we do it. We're guilty. All churches, all preachers, all church staff, we put this concoction together. Now, Lord, bless our work together. Really and truly, if you've been through experiencing God class, it's like this. Here's what God is doing, and we pray like this. Lord, let me get on board with whatever you're already doing because it works out a whole lot better. So I need to say, listen, Abraham could have said way back there, uh, no, we're not having any more children. I've already had one, and that's a mess up. I'm not going back there. 
But listen to God and quit telling him what you're going to do. A third thing is we don't need to question God. Now, God, are you sure? I'm fixed to take this knife and stab. God, are you sure about that? No, it don't say he questioned God. He was willing to do it. Now you, that's why I say you've got to go back to number one. You've got to know the promises. You've got to know what God's talking about because you don't need to make a mistake. Say, so, well, I misunderstood. I didn't read it right. Maybe I, I, I never got to that chapter. Yeah. That's why you need to know it. You need to be in the word. You need to be in prayer. You need to be in, in tune with the Lord. A fourth thing is we need to take action. It's one thing to sit around and say, you know, we're, we can meet in church on, on Sunday saying, saying we're standing on the promises while sitting on the premises. You got to take action. Serving God is activity. It's more than just coming to a church service on a Sunday morning. It is doing something for God on a regular basis. Places where you don't think about. And that concert last night, I looked at it, was almost 111,000 people in that stadium. The largest concert he's ever done. But I'm a people watcher. And some of them were just nuts. But there were people from all ages. Young, old. Some were cowboy looking. Some were not cowboy looking. And I looked around and I kept looking. I listened to the music, obviously, but I could hear people. And Of course, you know, I'm sorry, it's just me. I'm thinking, boy. I could see George say, hey, Pastor Ken, would you come up here and say a word? What I would have loved to share with 111,000 people. I would have told them not only he's the king of country, but let me tell you about the king of kings. His name is Jesus. I'd have given my eye teeth and then some for that. But I looked around, I saw the crowds of people, all kinds coming together. We are God's people. We are God's people, all types of people. Some from different backgrounds, some will never change you. We're not trying to put you into a mold. You don't have to be a mini me. You don't have to be a mini whoever it is and have to look like, act like, dress like. No, no, no. We were trying to act like Jesus. That's where that's our goal. He takes who you are, where you are, and he begins to work on you. He works on you. So that's why I say we take action. Let me give you just a side note on this. He didn't ask other people's opinions. He didn't say to his servants, now I'm going to go up here, but guys, what do y'all think? Be careful. He didn't ask for others' opinions because he knew that God had spoke to him. Sometimes you do need to ask for help. I get that. Sometimes you need to have wise leadership and wise uh, people with wisdom. I get that. But when you know God said to do it, you just need to step out and do it. His was not a small step of faith. Most of us would never face what he faced. We would never face that. Thank God for that. But his, his, his big step, this was huge, but it resulted in huge blessings. They would go back. And there would be a multiplication of God's people. His blessings were huge. And that brings it down to us today. Men, women, boys, girls. First, you have to have faith in Jesus to save you. But not just for that moment of salvation, but to live in you and direct you. To direct your path. Now, when I traveled last night, I'm in the middle of the night. I'm in the middle, way down somewhere south. I'm 80 miles from Waco to College Station. I'm on Highway 6. I've only been on that road a few times in my life. But I have a little device in, in my pocket, and it's giving me directions. And I'm watching. Teresa's trying to navigate. I said, I think it says turn here. She said, no, it don't. Well, I think it does. Well, no, it don't. But I needed navigation. I needed, I needed some direction. Because I don't normally travel that road. Watch this, please. 
You have things in your life that you may not normal, normally travel. God may open some doors for you. I'll give you a real life example that we have in our, in our church family is our heart of the city ministry. In the, our wildest imagination, from Rob to anybody involved, no one have ever thought it's doing what it's doing today. His goal, he said, I think we might can feed 100 people. Well, they do eight or 900 families a week now. It's the craziest thing in the world. So be careful. Be careful. Sometimes we have to let God navigate and we follow his will and his plan. Let me finish with this. Some questions. Are you living by faith or by fear? Abraham was living by faith. Honestly, I'm just, and this is transparent. Honestly, at this point, if it was me, I would be living in fear. That's now you're the preacher. No, no, I'm just me. I'm taking my son, my, my, my precious son, who I prayed for. A miracle came in. And I'm sucking up wind, and you want me to take his life? I don't find that in Abraham. My question is, are you living by faith or by fear? Ties in this, are you trusting or are you trembling? When God leads you, he's going to protect you. Who he calls, he equips. Some of you, he may ask you to teach a Sunday school class. He may ask you to teach a Bible school, vacation Bible school class. Well, I've never done that in my life. I found those like that. You end up learning more than the kids, obviously, because you've got to study the material. Are we trembling? Are we trusting? Are we obeying? Or are we being obstinate? Well, I don't care what he says. I ain't going to do that. Really? This is the Lord. He's giving you directives. Now, Pastor, I haven't got that kind of directive. God hadn't spoke to me, and I... Well, you really have. You've got a whole Bible full of directives. How to live, how to be a man of God, a woman of God. How to be a person of integrity, honesty. How are you going to conduct business tomorrow when you go to work? There's all kinds of things you can follow. The last question is, are, we, are you, are we willing, or are we waiting? I'm willing to go. I don't have to wait around. I'm willing to go. Sign me up. It was during World War II when America was bombed unmercifully. Pearl Harbor was attacked. I have an uncle that was on the USS Arizona when it was hit. He was one of the few survivors. It affected him the rest of his life. During that time, young men lied to the government about their age so they could serve. They signed up at 16 and 17 years old. They lied so they could get in. They, they were anxious to go and serve and protect their country. Put me in, coach. Let me serve. Give me a gun. Let me do whatever I can to save. And that's why we get that great generation We've celebrated Veterans Day and D-Day and those kind of things, those events. And they, they, they're charging in when others are running away from. Are you willing? Or are you just waiting around? So I'll, I'll wait till something better comes along. I'll wait for another opportunity. No. This was the time, the one and only time that God said to him, go and do this. And God honored it. He was faithful, and God blessed it. God may be asking you, and I don't have a long list of things he's asking you. I don't have that. But in your heart, you may know it. In your heart, you may be searching it out. And God may be speaking to you through the preaching, through the word, through a friend, through the Bible. And as you do, Lord, is this really what I need to do? And if it is, sign me up. I want to be anxious to go. I want to be anxious to go. I want to serve. I want to be a, a warrior on the battlefield for my Lord. And I want to try to live by faith as best as I can. I'm a person, when you, you present something to me, I need to see it. I, I need to think about it. I, I don't do a quick reaction. Never have, never will. 
But if I know God's in it, I'm going to support it 100%. And you may be similar to me. You may have to think, you know, Lord, is this really you? And if it is, if the door's open, I want to go. If the door's closed, I want to stop. Some of you men, you are leaders. We need leaders in our homes. We need godly men. Not just a fellow, but I'm talking about a godly man who will lead by example, who will say, thus saith the Lord, and it's for me and my house. We're going to take the lead, and we're going to serve God. Today, America is crying out. I believe our weakest point in America right now is the lack of godly men in the homes. Fellas, stand up for Jesus. Ladies, support him and back him. Stand up for Jesus. Whatever your home is like, stand up for Jesus. Be a person of faith. I call that a mountain of faith. They went to Moriah. And they found the ram caught in the thicket. The Lord will provide. Let me pray. Lord in heaven, you have ordered our steps. You knew exactly who would be here today, who would hear this, who's watching us even online. And there's someone here today who needs to step out in faith and be saved. They don't need to question. They don't need to think about it, even pray about it. They just need to get saved. They need to give their heart to Jesus today. But Lord, there's many in this room, they've done that. And I pray that they will be men and women who will make a difference, who will stand head and shoulder above others in their Christian faith. Lord, and I know it's tough. I know it's tempting to sit back and just coast. But Lord, you've called us to serve you. And Lord, sometimes we're gonna go through battles in our homes and our families with illnesses, with family crises, outside of the church building. Lord, there's where really faith will kick in. We'll trust you when the doctors may not give a good report. We will trust you when the boss man says things are tough at the, at the job. We will trust you when our kids are struggling in school. We will trust you when our marriage is on the rocks. We will trust you, dear God, when others may not. I don't need their opinions. Lord, give me faith, trust, and hope in you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.